Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I think it is my great pleasure to address this distinguished conference on the practical application. I would like to underline again the practical application of the principle of subsidiarity from the parliamentary point of view. As the chair of the, I used to say, the most important committee of the Hungarian parliament, but the problem is nobody believes it, but uh, chairing this committee, I think I am a privileged position to share sort of first-hand uh, experiences with you on how national parliaments to try to locate the principle of subsidiarity in a legislative text. My dear friends, it is not easy task because the subsidiarity itself is like, a, how can I say, a needle in the haystack. The committee chaired by myself has a crucial role in analyzing and identifying the possible breach of the principle of subsidiarity in the legislative proposals. In a Hungarian National Assembly, I can say that the plenary, after debate of course, adopts so-called reasoned opinion on a proposal of the Committee on the European Affairs. As I remember since the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisboa in December 2009, national parliaments may carry out ex ante and ex post control regarding the application of the subsidiarity principle. My dear friends, as you are aware that the national EU national parliaments are entitled by protocol number two, I very often will mention protocol number two, to examine the application of the principle of subsidiarity at the legislative proposal submitted under the above-mentioned protocol. I have to say, my dear friends, national parliaments are explicitly not entitled to conduct an examination regarding the principle of proportionately. I can see, my dear friends, that the treaties do not give the EU's institutions a blank check to do what they want. Subsidiarity and proportionately are the practical tools to ensure that the Union does do what the member states, or I can add a the, the regional authorities can better to themselves. The principle of subsidiarity being a dynamic notion is, I can say, rather a political than a legal question. Moreover, there are no real strict rules that would help the national parliaments to decide on subsidiarity. This is one of the basic problems. Diverging interpretations mean national parliaments with similar interest may take very, very different approaches uh, to issuing reasoned opinions under protocol number two. The reason behind this phenomenon, I have to say, is that quite simple, the national interest the national interest, which mainly determines the position of the member states about the legislative draft. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairpersons of the European Union committees meet at least four times a year in a framework of COSAC, which is a very important consultative forum to discuss different European issues. As I remember, as a, one of the oldest members of the COSAC. Over the years, COSAC has addressed many, many, many times to procedure set in protocol number two. As I remember in 2015, a working group set up on a possibility to improve the yellow card procedure. But Unfortunately, the COSAC failed to elaborate a common methodology for subsidiarity issues. This is 
the other problem, ladies and gentlemen. During the past decade, uh, the Hungarian National Assembly adopted not more than six reasoned opinions on different draft legislative acts. As I remember, the very first case was the proposal on the establishment of the European Public Persecutor's Office, the so-called EPPO, in autumn 2013. Our parliament, among other things, highlighted that the supranational model of the EPPO would disproportionately limit the member states' sovereignty in the field of the criminal law. This pioneer case introduced the international procedure and practices in the National Assembly regarding Protocol No. 2, and all participants got familiar with the challenges. I have to say it is a, a typical procedure for a parliament, and it differs from the normal routine legislative work. Our experience show that the active involvement of government and its expertise is really necessary in the preparation of the region's opinion. This involvement should be more structured and strengthened in the future. This is the third problem. My dear friends, under Protocol 2, national parliaments have eight weeks to deliver a reasoned opinion if they consider that draft legislation doesn't comply with the principle of the subsidiarity. And this is the so-called early, early warning system. Early warning system has resulted so far in three yellow cards, meaning reasoned opinions issued by the national parliaments represented at least one third of all votes allocated to them. The first one in 2012 on the proposal for the so-called Monty II regulation. The second one in 2013 on, a, on the proposal for a regulation on the establishment of the EPPO and finally the third one in 2016 on the proposal for revision of the directive on the posting workers. In this place, I would like to thank very much to, for uh, his activities, Lord Boswell, who was the chairman of the House of Lords European uh, Affairs Committee. Thanks for his really uh, famous activities between us. Unfortunately, he is in retired. And of course, the Hungarian National Assembly participated, I think, actively in the last two yellow cards procedure. And on all three occasions, the Commission stated that the principle of subsidiarity was respective. Very good. But the review by the national parliaments did not directly lead to withdrawal of proposals for reasons of subsidiarity. And according to the Commission, the so-called Monty II regulation was withdrawn. And listen to me. Withdraw not for subsidiarity concerns, as we were, were waiting for, but because the objections amounted to a blocking vote in the Council. This is the fourth problem. Whereas the EPPO and the revisions to the Posted Workers Directive continue despite the objections because the Commission considered the concerns unwarranted. In the case of the Post Workers Directive, the subsidiarity arguments raised in the recent opinion of national parliaments. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the Commission concluded that its proposal complies with the principle of subsidiarity set for in Article 5 of the Treaty on European Union and decided, therefore, to maintain the proposal. That's the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Naturally, 
This refusal of arguments, as I remember formulated in the three yellow cards procedure, caused a really deep frustration and dissatisfaction among the national parliament, and it has long-lasting consequences. For example, last year was not a single reasoned opinion. My dear friends, when Protocol 2 entered into practice, I also remember many MPs, including academic circles, felt optimism. That's all, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we are just in a good way. And anticipated a brand new chapter in the involvement of parliaments in the so-called EU decision-making process. That time, ladies and gentlemen, with full of hope, the future seemed to be bright and really prosperous. Pres pro prosperous. The current period is rather characterized by inaction of parliaments, and I have to say a sort of unwillingness to act. At the same time, the new commission has so far also failed to put forward several legislative proposals. My dear friends, I have, I have taken stock based on uh, decade-long experiences. I have to say, the picture is rather greyish than rosy. There are several factors behind a very sad future, uh, sort of somber outlook. One of the basic contradictions which constitutes the root cause itself is the unequal capacities of the different parties. I mean, the Commission versus Parliament. The Commission, just let's think about it. The Commission elaborates for a longer period, sometimes four years. A draft legislative proposal prepared by of course, well-paid professionals and consulted upon by many commission services, around 4,000 people. What can we see on the other side? On the other side of the playing field, the national parliaments, first of all, have limited time frame, just eight weeks, and they should examine a legal draft which is sometimes, may I say, a terra incognita, a uncharted territory for them, for us MPs. It is a type of David and Goliath, in Hungarian pronunciation, David and Goliath struggle, when national parliaments are destined for the role of the underdogs, unfortunately. The balance, this unbalanced situation, Parliament has to rely on the expertise of its government, so these two actors usually work closely together. And this is a place where I would like to thank very much for Professor Minister Trochani, who is a good friend of us, and uh, during his ministry, he really helped a lot, giving lots of good experts on formulating a really good uh, um, resolution or um, papers. Um, it was really required. Thank you very much, Laszlo. Dear colleagues, and finally, I wish to mention another issue which probably not a well known between us. I would like to mention protocol num number two which does not cover the whole EU legislation, but only a small, smaller part thereof. I guess, my dear friends, it is only 20% of annual EU legislation that belongs to the scope of protocol. How about the other 80%? The remaining 80% is not legislative acts delegated or implementing legislations or belong to exclusive EU competence. Protocol number two introduced a standstill period, 
eight weeks for parliamentary review. But after this period, I have to say, remembering in the Hungarian practice, that the EU legislator pay less attention to the subsidiarity principle. My dear friends, we are holding this conference and in the spirit of and the preparation for the so-called Future of Europe conference. I believe it is worth mentioning that two years ago, the task force was set up for improving the practical implementation of the principle of subsidiarity. The task force was for a runner, I have to say, of the actual initiative to discuss the common European matters. Although they prepared a report with the article titled Active Subsidiarity, a new way of working, but cannot consider the proposals of the task force as a breakthrough. My dear friends, having examined the issue of complex EU legislation. The task force, for example, concluded that there is EU value added in all existing policy areas. Therefore, did not identify any competencies or policy areas that should be redelegated to the member states. My dear friends, Mr. Chairman, I tried to present, first of all, to give answers uh, to your question and to summarize in one lecture a complex, in a complex picture about the parliamentary review of the principle of subsidiarity. I believe, my dear friends, this is an important tool which should be developed at the national level, but it is definitely not the only tool. We should and will use the set of tools available for national parliament, like political dialogue, like scrutiny and meeting with commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I think this conference will give lots of answers for the uncertain problems which goes around in the European Union and will help to create a real picture on the future of Europe. Thank you very much.